few days ago, Tim and I recorded a podcast in which I tormented Tim by talking about the 1990 American Music Awards, and Tim was banned from speaking. That episode has not yet been broadcast, but in anticipation of the reaction and possible legal action or intervention by the European Union or something, uh, I've decided, even by my standards, that was a bit too cruel. And we're making a special little mini episode now where I'm going to I'm gonna give Tim his voice back. I'm going to let him off the leash, talk about these awards. Permission to speak? Permission granted, $185, completely protected, <laughs> sent to the girls. <laughs> On the condition I get a little glimpse of the stationery they buy, because... I really like stationery too, and I want to see what they end up buying. Yeah. <laughs> Tim, you are off the leash. Off the leash. Wow. I feel liberated. It's marvellous to be able to speak, <laughs> particularly about the 1990 American Musical Awards. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I mean, it's a topic. Since the podcast started, it's a topic that people have been dying to hear about. Now they're getting a second episode of it. They are. <laughs> and then, then we've got 91 and 92 and 93. <laughs> They've had my opinion, but now they're going to get the opinion that really matters. Well, this is true. This is true. And and I, I, I don't know where to start. There's so much to say. How was it hearing me describe them? Did I do a good job? It was very fascinating. There were two things going on. One is it was enormously frustrating to have prepared and thought and to know this and then not be able to say anything. That was the torture. <laughs> On the other hand, I quite enjoyed hearing you talk about it as well because it was sort of <laughs> vicarious, you know. It was like, oh, he's appreciating it too. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I never thought I'd hear someone else give a commentary on this award ceremony from 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I was thinking, I was like, oh, what's up next? Oh, yeah, okay. And then, oh, no, look. And then almost immediately I was frustrated that you were the one that was talking about it and... um. <laughs> <laughs> Next episode, Tim's going to talk for two hours about the moon landings. That's right. Yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and just guess what's happening at one point or another. Um, that will drive you uh, mad. From the historic Shrine Auditorium in Los Angeles, it's the 17th annual American Music Award. Why did you record this? That's a good question. I've been thinking about that for the last um, few days. I, I just think it was exciting it was we'd had a video machine for a few years but there was something about it I'd never seen anything like this on television before I'd seen sort of the Logie ceremonies and the Academy Awards I guess but there was something I like it, it was the promise of so many artists together for some reason I was very I was quite desperate to record it and then to watch it even though none of my favorite artists are on there, it's not like I captured a unique Michael Jackson performance, who I really loved at the time, or mm. Bon Jovi performance. It just seemed an important thing to watch, and yeah. so that was the occasion behind taping it. <laughs> and after you'd taped it, how many times would you guess you watched it? Like, you know, did you watch it a few times the next day, or like, was it like, did it live up to the hype when you finally watched it? Your expectations? What did it still excite you? It wasn't like I watched it because I loved it so much. Like that year, I also taped Spartacus and I watched the film Spartacus over and over and over again and I loved it. This I didn't love so much. It was just like an enjoyable thing because I love music and it was just something to put on, I think. Like it was all you had. <laughs> it was a bit like that. Yeah, yeah. Like I've got a couple of tapes yeah. and this is one of them and I don't have many others. It wasn't like you had MTV or cable or Netflix or things where you could or the internet where you could just go and watch all the music you wanted. That's right. That's exactly right. It was a bit like I had one YouTube not even one YouTube yeah. channel, one YouTube clip and I'm going to play it over and over again. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it was. It was just sort of something to watch that was entertaining without really loving it that much although so the thing that was interesting about it is that I remembered so much about it and I always have and I put it on the other day and it all came flooding back including the wording I, I could say like I could give exact same wording with people's acceptance speeches in sync with them word perfect and I thought that was a bit hmm. strange really but for some reason it stuck and I don't, <laughs> I don't know what. How many times would you guess you've what you'd watched it? I don't know, maybe twelve or fifteen times, maybe twenty. Mm. You do watch things over and over when you're young. You're quite happy to, mm. like Die Hard. I had on video, and I watched that maybe thirty times. Yeah. Dead Poet Society. I watched like 
you know, as many times. You just seem to watch things over and over. <laughs> it's like you're just giving me all the ammunition for future episodes where I'm <laughs> things I can ban you from talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Brady does Dead Poet Society and Spartacus. Yeah. Like, I remember as a kid getting the Black Stallion, the movie The Black Stallion Returns, actually, oh, yeah. the second one out of the video store, and watching it yeah. three times in 24 hours before we took it back. Hmm. That's just crazy, but you do do that when you're a kid, I think. I don't remember those films. Does the Black... Like, normally uh, films about animals, the animals die. Does the Black Stallion die in the first film? No. No. No, so it can return. I've, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> right. It's not back from the dead. <laughs> no, no, it's not. No, they just... Right. The original owners of the Black Stallion come back to take it back to um, Arabia, I guess, Saudi Arabia. I, I can't really remember yeah. the details. And then he goes after it, no. stows away on a plane and... Um, the horse on its own stows away on a plane. <laughs> no, no. The boy. Is it one of those ones where it goes up into the wheel engine bay? <laughs> he, do, he goes up with the wheels in the wheel compartment. Yeah. 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 <laughs> nice. Not the horse. This is the boy. <laughs> oh, right. I thought the horse stows away. Like, wow, that's a, that horse really wanted to get home. <laughs> I'm just imagining the wheelbase opening and like all these wheels coming down, but from one wing there's just these legs dangling <laughs> as you land, <laughs> running on the runway. <laughs> yeah, and someone's there. How many horsepower is those? I wrote those engines. <laughs> it's like one horse jumps out, runs away. Oh, you, you're really wasting your t- your chance to talk about the American <laughs> musical. Awards, We're talking about the Black Stallion returns. <laughs> Not even that. We're making up. Stupid alternative plots for it. Uh, well, look. So that was my first point. I think it's important to say I was intrigued by the Dick Clark invention. I didn't know that Dick Clark invented it. I know that Dick Clark is a legend of American television. You know, with I think it's Bandstand and some other shows. But mm. I've never thought much of Dick Clark in it. After I heard him featured in some documentary, I can't remember. Maybe it was even Michael Moore's documentary where they featured him and apparently his slogan, like his famous brand slogan, which is music is the soundtrack of our lives. And I remember thinking, well, that's the most bleeding obvious statement. Like that's like music is the soundtrack of our lives. And he's got that on the side of restaurants and the side of his, you know, brand name and his car and everything. But that's that's just like saying... What else could be the soundtrack of our lives? That's right. It's like words are the book of our life. Like it's... (laughs) (laughs) Words are the words of our lives. (laughs) Like like air is the oxygen of our lives. It's like, yeah, it is. (laughs) Thanks, champ. Like... (laughs) Earth is the planet of our lives. It is. (laughs) (laughs) So... So that's nice. um, the other thing that stood out very strongly to me in my memory was the performance of New Kids on the Block. Now, I, I've ac- I was right. never a fan of New Kids on the Block. Even watching this, I thought, oh, this is a bit, you know, cheesy. And now looking back at it again, it's extremely cheesy. And they do one of those medleys, right? Yeah. Which is, I know you don't like the medley. And I'm not a big fan of the medley either, which it's, it seems to be a way of sort of indicating none of these songs are strong enough to hold up for three minutes on their own. But, yeah. you know, 10 minutes, 10 seconds of each will work. It also just screams of self-promotion. Like, this is my opportunity. I'm going to throw everything down your throat I can. Like, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm going to make the most of this moment. I remember seeing Simply Red do a medley at one of those Royal Variety charity performances. And it really just felt like, oh, yeah, I, I would get bored of any more of this song. Oh, there's a new song. Oh, that's nice. So there's, mm. you know, it cheapens the songs, I think. But the New Kids on the Block medley mm. is so... You know, you you know when you can tell most people, in fact, almost all of them are lip syncing in these performances, right? Yeah, especially Millie Vanilli. Especially, especially Millie Vanilli. <laughs> yeah, who <laughs> even who did the lip syncing on their own album, which yeah took it to another level. They were lip syncing themselves, lip syncing. <laughs> From that perspective, perhaps their performance was the more authentic performance of any of them. <laughs> yeah, because at least they were um, truly representing their performance from the album. But New Kids on the Block haven't learned that. When you're lip syncing, 
the temptation is to overplay your the act of singing, you know, like almost to a comic level to show I'm moving my mouth and arms and legs. So they when you're actually singing naturally, you just stand there and sing. But when you're lip syncing, you kind of want to do the whole look at me singing kind of thing. And they just go over the top and it's it looks quite ridiculous. It's, and, and, They're and kind of hamming it up too much. They are hamming it up too much. And that makes that's quite a funny performance, really, in the way they look at each other and yeah. the way he falls to his knees and how he does. Anyway, that's stuck in my memory for 30 years. And um, <laughs> I, was, I was able to feel a deep sense of satisfaction watching again how... Um, accurately, I had remembered the hamming and performance of New Kids on the Block. Was there anything you saw in the show that, like, that you loved, that, like, really, like, you know, you thought was awesome and, like, you know, it was a turning point for you? Like, a performance that you thought was good or a performer that you were introduced to that you then stuck with or... Yeah, there were two. One was, I was really thrilled to see the performance of Alice Cooper. Hmm. He, um, you know, he's a rock artist and, you know, he did a song there and I thought, oh, that's pretty cool and I'd known a little bit of Alice Cooper from his big hit Poison, but I really enjoyed that and I played that lots of times. And I was introduced to Rod Stewart through this video. I don't think mm. I'd ever heard of Rod Stewart before. And mm. he has Downtown Train and I remember loving that and then going off and finding it and wanting to listen to it. And I've always enjoyed it. It's a really great song. So I, I think this would be the first moment when I've ever encountered Rod Stewart. Not that I'm a terribly huge Rod Stewart fan. I was also really intrigued, as you were, to see Kenny Loggins. Like, yeah. he, he, so many Kenny Loggins songs, and yet he doesn't ever seem to have had a visual presence through any of them or in any place. He never seems to have toured or anything like that. But from, I think it's Top Gun, isn't it? And Footloose. I mean, Footloose is a fantastic soundtrack. He should be touring and all over the place, but he didn't seem to appear in anything except a couple of these really awesome songs. So it was funny to see him presenting an award. He didn't perform. So that was a turning point. That was interesting. Hmm. I, I concurred with your views on Richard Marx's hair. And his band. They were like together. They oh. were like, there was a lot of... They were skunk-like. Keratin. Is that what hair's made of? <laughs> a lot of keratin went into that performance. It was. A, a collection of skunks. He looked amazing. Richard Marks, you'd have to say, though, there's been a bit of a Samson effect in that he, since he cut his hair, he seems to have <laughs> lost his powers and he yeah. has diminished. And I would, it would be interesting to see him... There, there's a reality show in watching him grow his hair out again and then following his... Musical fortunes, because I think his <laughs> musical abilities flow from his hair. Do you think he could do a Samson and like say, look, I know I did the wrong thing. I cut my hair. It's cost me my career. But please, God, give me one more hit. Give me one last burst of strength like he did for Samson. Oh, wow. That would be, <laughs> that would be amazing. It's like his hair grew back. And he just got one more, one more massive hit. But it was this kind of self-sacrifice sort of suicide or one like Samson. Going down in a blaze of glory. Taking himself to... <laughs> he hasn't had a hit for a long time, has he? I think the last thing I think I remember of his is that Hazard, Hazard song in 1992. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm. I liked that one. Anyway, a lot of, lot of big hair going on there. That was like that was like a, you know, goodbye to the 80s with a big, with a big flourish of hair. It's funny that you... Oh, no, two more things as well. One was um, mm. Guns N' Roses. So it was interesting that you, you talked about how wasted Slash was. And that's true. In fact, that's quite legendary. There are people have written about that. It appears in Slash's biography, which I've read, and other rock books and on the internet how wasted they were, he and Duff McKagan, the bass player, were at that award ceremony, and the fact that they swore on television. That was mm. really big in 1990, and they were drunk. Yeah. Yeah, so that was that was a... You were right to highlight that moment. That's actually like a little moment in, in rock folklore. Right. Yeah, so well done, man. Lyle Lovett. Yes. This was the first time I've ever observed Lyle Lovett. In fact, there are a whole suite of country artists there that I'd never heard of before. Yeah. Uh, like Reba McIntyre and Alabama and all those sorts of bands. Randy Travis, who's who's got a, a chin like you wouldn't believe, hasn't he? But he's, he doesn't seem to move any lips when he's singing. He just sort of stands there with a chiseled-faced Mount Rushmore sort of 
you know, chin. He's very stationary. He's a very stationary performance. Yeah, yeah. His lips don't... It's like he's some sort of ventriloquist should be... Or he should be the ventriloquist and he's actually making a puppet like country artist sing or something. But (laughs) he does a very good job. But Lyle Lovett, I think that's the first time. And if I'm... I was thinking about this because somebody a few weeks ago mentioned Lyle Lovett to me and said, you've got to check out this song by Lyle Lovett. And I was like, oh, I haven't thought of him for years. And I wonder if that's the subconscious seed that made me remember the music awards and go looking. It wasn't conscious, but I wonder if that's what triggered it because Ah. there was some sort. So that could be the root of what's going on here. The Lyle love it factor. It is extraordinary that he was married to Julia Roberts. Like I know looks aren't everything. But that is like such an unlikely pairing. It was after the awards by the looks of it. It looks like they like eloped and got married in ninety three after like a three week romance. So it was like years after these music awards, but uh and they divorced after less than two years. Um uh, So it sounds like Julia Roberts was like me, sitting at home watching the music awards, seeing Lyle <laughs> Love It. And um well, and wanting to marry him. That wasn't my response, but but she's gone. No. <laughs> this is after Pretty Woman too. She was pretty huge at Pretty Woman around this time as well. So Oh, she was it was massive. It was a massive story when it happened. Yeah. So speaking of seeing people in the awards and wanting to marry them, were there any like, you know, were there any performers that you looked at and thought, Oh, you know, got like, you know, celebrity crushes or anything? I don't reckon there were. There's no one I really no. loved. Like Peter, uh, Paula Abdul, I was never a really big fan. <laughs> Peter <of>. Abdul. <laughs> Peter Abdul. <laughs> her brother, that's right. Um, <laughs> I I was not a big fan of her. I thought she had a good song, but, you know, like, not really. Janet Jackson? I like Janet Jackson, but I don't really remember her. In this, it wasn't. I became a huge Janet Jackson fan later on after this with the album uh, Rhythm Nation. I seem to recall that. Mm. Yeah, I recall that. I always, I was always intrigued by the Judds. Do you remember seeing the Judds, which are a mother and daughter, Naomi and Wynonna Judd, country right. act? And I always thought, like a, a mother and daughter, like a two generations together as a pairing, like that's pretty rare. And I thought that was quite interesting. Yeah. Yeah, you don't get that much. Like if you had Roxette, but one of them was like, you know, the mum of the other one. Like that would that would be quite <laughs> un- <laughs> unusual. I was likewise um, disappointed with the introversion of Prince. He hmm. tried to act like an enigma and he didn't... The trouble with Prince, they played that great package of, of him bouncing around all over the place. Fantastic. All these 80 hit, 80s hits. Hmm. Then he comes out and he didn't do enough to to subvert the noise of the crowd and get on with his speech. And so Mm. I was thinking about this because he sort of stands there and he's like a little mouse going, thank you, thank you. And, you know, people just screaming. But he could have Mm. said, okay, all right, all right, all right, everyone. Now, I just want to say thanks to everyone for the, you know, my award. It's pretty meaningless, but, you know, thanks very much for inviting me along. (laughs) See you next year. Thank you, God. You know, and off we go. But he didn't. He, He remained timid, which is... Uh, I think it might be even a subtle show business way of making the crowd's praise become, sound bigger and more effusive than ever. You know, like, oh, mm. he couldn't even get his speech in. The crowd was going so wild. And it's like, that's because he was so tiny. You know what I mean? Like, he manages to get yeah. through Purple Rain when he's on tour. Like, he can get through a speech. But I think he was sort of, you know, playing small. I'd like to thank Dick Clark, uh, the American Music Awards, and Nita Baker, thank you. It is something different about these awards, isn't it? Letting, like, the screaming girls up on the top of the balcony in. Like, like they don't do that at, like, the Oscars. So you've got, like, on the <laughs> in the bottom deck, you've got all the stars, but then you've got the screaming crowd every time New Kids on the Block get mentioned. And it kind of, it makes for a weird atmosphere. You can't quite tell if this is, like a fan moment, like a concert, or is this like, you know, an industry award ceremony? It's it's sort of, you know, spans the two. Yeah. I know that's like a genre of award ceremonies, but it's probably not my favourite. Yeah, yeah, I know. And and if you were to critique it, their defence would be, well, it's the people's award, you know, it's what yeah. they want yeah. and they're in. It's not this highfalutin red, you know, black tie sort of event. Can I say a couple yeah. more things? Bobby Brown. So Bobby Brown's here and he, that album, which is... um. 
uh, uh, Don't Be Cruel is a great album and I still pop that on from time to time and he plays he does my prerogative and every little step. I know he wasn't a very good husband later on to Whitney Houston mm. at all, but um mm. that that was a good album. This was actually his sort of prime moment. There was also a mm. band there called um Warrant who are awful, who are just awful. <laughs> and there's another band called Great White who I know nothing about. Like I I literally know nothing about them. And it's not often I'd say that about a band that reaches this stage, but Great White have not penetrated the Tim knowledge wo- uh, library at all. Right. Are you are you a right. fan of Great White? Are you Oh yeah, in fact I have a signed picture of them on my wall. So yeah. <laughs> Wow <laughs> That is no, a surprise. I have no, I have no I reckon when they were going through that list at the start, I probably knew fifty percent of the performers, maybe. There were a lot of performers who's didn't seem to you know, that I've never heard of. Like yeah, people who were just and this yeah. is funny, they were huge. Like Anita Baker. I'd never heard of Anita Baker before. But I looked her up. She sounds like she should be someone from the 50s. Like when they introduced her, I thought it was going to be like, you know, Aretha Franklin or someone and some like really old lady was going to walk out. And she kind of was a bit like an old lady, but with a young person's face. Like, (laughs) it was weird. (laughs) I don't know what her era is or what, like she seemed like an old, she seemed like she'd come there in a time machine. (laughs) Like she looked like she was like a 50s star, but she was like, but looked the right age. Mm, Born mm. in 1958. So, yeah. Yeah. Started a career in the 70s, right? And she sold like 10 million copies of her albums. And we've never heard of her. She's never broken Australia, which is where it counts. Yeah. So She's 62 now. So, yeah, she would have been 32 then. So, oh, she's a lot younger than I... Oh, I reckon. Yeah. yeah. She does seem like a sort of an AOR, you know, like an adult um, contemporary artist rather than a... You know, yeah. she wasn't dancing. She didn't have Paula Abdul's no. sort of, you know, cartoon cat bouncing no. around next to her or anything like that. I also feel like in 1990, obviously, God was a lot more involved in the music process because he was being <laughs> thanked a lot more than he is these days. He got a lot more credit back then, didn't he? And I don't yeah. think it's credit he necessarily <laughs> wants to get. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everyone was thanking God. I don't feel like God gets thanked as much these days. Um, no, no. Maybe he's just less involved in music now. <laughs> I think he's semi-retired from the music industry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he was very influential back then. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, he's he, he got credit for a few albums that I don't think he had anything to do with. <laughs> <laughs> what are your thoughts on Millie Vanilli? Because it felt like this was Millie Vanilli's night. I like their songs a lot. Um, they're actually, it's great pop music. And I remember dancing, you know, at the like little disco thing at school that year Mm. to them and stuff. I think that they had a good album. I I remember taping Girl, I'm Gonna Miss You off the radio and just listening to it over and over and over again. Like, you know, I'd listen to it 10 times in a row on my little tape player. Yeah. Well, I mean, I didn't have a crush on them like you obviously did, but I... (laughs) (laughs) Not both of them. I had my favourite. (laughs) <laughs> Both Millie and Vanilli. What were they called? Was it like Robert and Fabian or something? One of them's dead now, you know. I know. Yeah, Rob and Fab. Yeah. Right. It's funny though, when you hear them talk, hmm. present an award or or anything like that, you suddenly go, oh yeah, like that's obviously, <laughs> you're not obviously going to sing as clearly as you do because they have very strong accents. So it suddenly feels very obvious, doesn't it? But of course we... Yeah. We wouldn't have known. This award is for the favorite pop rock album. And the three nominees are for brought a few friends. Watch this. And I tell you, they wouldn't be the first in history and they won't be the last. But there's an enormous amount of, um, you know, dodgy performances and all that sort of stuff go on. But of course, a lot of it is legitimate now because of auto-tunes. The way you can manipulate someone's voice Mm. is, is... If a huge producer came up to you and I and said, look, we really like the Unmade podcast and we want you guys to be like mega stars but you're not good enough singers and mm. tim's guitar work clearly isn't up to scratch <laughs> but would you would you be would you be willing to pretend and go on tour like and mouth you know would you would you do it would you risk it absolutely let's do it let's do it. <laughs> we could be the unmade pop stars <laughs> hein heron heron and hein <laughs> oh who's your favorite tim or brady <laughs> 
I like the one that pretends to play guitar. Oh yeah, that's Tim. <laughs> well, I like the dancer. That's the. <laughs> <laughs> you think I'd be the dance guy? <laughs> <laughs> yep. I tell you, one thing we should take from Millie Vanilli, they seem to wear berets, and I reckon we'd suit a couple of berets. We should. Wear, we should yeah. definitely. Yeah, yeah. Some lovely flat caps. Oh. I've got two flat caps. I haven't got a beret, but I've got two flat caps in my house. I've got a flat cap. We're, we're, we're halfway there. Yeah. Isn't a beret just a flat cap turned around the other way? Or is it... What would we be called? Would we be Brilly Tanilly? <laughs> Brilly Tanilly. Timmy Brilly Tanilly. Brilly Tanilly. Brilly Tanilly. Brilly to Millie. All right, that's it. We might need to workshop that a little bit. Oh, hang on a sec. Here we go. The Real Millie Vanilli's official website. Oh, that's the real Millie Vanilli. This is the people who did the singing, who came yeah. out with another album afterwards, as if we somehow wanted to hear them without the cool dudes yeah, at the front. Like, well, yeah. Who cares? Yeah. This is I'm a, all about Rob and Fab. This is a cool-looking 90s website, though, that's for sure. It's got, it's got total... It's... um. Seems to be preserved in... Uh... We should ask the the real Millie Vanilli if they're willing to do it again and be like the singers for us, the unmade pop stars. What, you reckon we make the music but we not be the image? Is that what you're saying? We ask no, them to... no, they make our music. They make the music and we'll, we'll mouth it. So they'll do it again. Like the second time they'll be like... Oh, man. Who would be the front man of the unmade pop stars? Oh, I think that's... I think that's pretty obvious. I mean, I would probably... Be me, wouldn't it? <laughs> Just because I'm the Brian Wilson with the musical genius doesn't mean that I... <laughs> the Brian Wilson, are you? Yeah, yeah. I'm the, <laughs> I'm the one slaving at a, at a keyboard and a desk for, for, for weeks, putting it all together. <laughs> I feel that's like tr- I'm the Brian Wilson. Oh, that's true. You are the Brian Wilson. I'm... I'm- I'm really here. I'm just, I'm just here for my looks, which is saying a lot. Saying it's a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> we need someone. We, we need someone who sounds like he looks pretty good, but we don't actually ever want to see him. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh dear. <laughs> All right, back. So Millie Vanilla, you, you kind of sounds like you've got to approve of them in a way. Even though, even despite their betrayal to music. Oh, look, I think that. Well, yes, no, they're, it, it's still a couple of good songs, but I um no, obviously it's it's artificial, but it's it's all rubbish. The whole the whole awards are artificial. They're totally meaningless and so forth. It's it's um, oh, yeah. just a marketing exercise. It's totally ridiculous. Crazy. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 um it's kind of funny in a way. Yeah. That they just faked a pop band, but it's. Got nothing to do with anything that I value about music, and there's none of these performances that I actually genuinely love or listen to, except "Downtown Train" is a good is a good song, but it wasn't even written by um, by Rod Stewart. Well, if it, if it leads to the launch of "Brilly to Millie," it'll all be worth it. Well, maybe "Downtown Train" should be our first song. What do you reckon? Like a cover? Yeah. Yeah. Well, can you play that one on the guitar? Yeah, I could. I could learn it. Um. <laughs> Well, you didn't learn money for nothing, so why are you going to learn this one? I reckon I could play this almost as well. I'll have to have a look at it. It's written by Tom Waits, actually, It's um, which is hmm. unusual. But, it, it, yeah, it's a beautiful song. I love it. All right. All right, we'll give it a bash. Well, we'll see if we can write something first. If you can't write something, we've always got Downtown Train to fall back yeah. on. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'd love to write something. I'd love our first single to be something we wrote. I remember you telling me years ago that I was letting the team down because you, you said to me that you said... Tim, I'm pretty good at writing lyrics and words and mm. stuff. Um, mm. And you play guitar. We should be pretty good, except that you don't play guitar well enough. Like you're letting the team down. Like we, like as if yeah. it's as simple as would be really <laughs> would be making amazing music. If only I was a great musician, because you're already a great lyricist. <laughs> <laughs> It's also probably a bit of a stretch to say I'm a great lyricist. But well, I thought it was at the time. I, I don't know. I had a job that involved words. <laughs> yeah. You're certainly a better lyricist than you were a musician. And that's still that's the case. Right. <laughs> it's still the case for me too. Which is <laughs> Any more notes from the Music Awards? Well, long may they live. Um, hmm. I, I, I still don't know if they're continuing on or what's going on with them. I think they are still a thing. They're still going. Hmm. I believe. The Australian Music yeah. Awards don't happen anymore, I don't think. 
We have the Arias, which is sort of our version of the Grammys. But even like yeah. people leave the after parties with them, like they leave their award. Like the band called the Cruel Sea once left the after party with their award literally rammed into the wall and they just walked away, <laughs> just left it there. <laughs> Rammed into the that bar wall. That is partly wall. just to kind of look cool, though, isn't it? But, you know, there's a bit of like, oh, I, I don't care about awards. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it is. It, it's funny if you're supposed to care about these sorts of awards or not. It must be kind of weird. That, of course they care about them. I mean, I even in my the worlds I've worked in, you know, when I was a journalist, when I worked at the BBC, even now working in YouTube, there are all these meaningless award ceremonies. Mm. And I've been to some of them, mm. and I've won some of them, mm. and I know they're meaningless. But still, you really want to win it, and you still—I still have them sitting here on my mantelpiece. Right. I haven't. I haven't smashed it into the wall like the cruel sea. <laughs> <laughs> that would be kind of rock and roll, having my webby or my YouTube gold button. I should smash my YouTube gold button. Oh, I don't care. Only if you don't. film it and put it out as a YouTube clip. Yeah, oh, yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> That's, that's content. That's right. Yeah, that's right. That's so and so. It's content. <laughs> I might, I might win an award for it. Janet Jackson does do a pretty good performance in here, and and she's probably the best performer and the yeah of of the lot. I think. I don't like what she's wearing though. It looks like she's wearing like a power suit or something. It looks like she's going to go and try to close a deal afterwards. No, I like that. I like the long boots and the jacket and stuff. I think that's pretty cool. She's wearing gloves as well. Yeah, she's just got a whole bunch of sort of Italian waiters dancing with her though. That's a little bit strange. If you could meet any person from this award ceremony, like go for a beer with them or you know, hang out for hang out for a few hours and have a meal, who would you who would you choose? That's a good question. My instinctive answer is Janet Jackson simply because I had that period where I was a really big fan and she mm. would be an interesting person to, to oh, maybe to meet. I don't know. She's sort of that legend. In terms of sitting down, having a long chat or hanging out with Alice Cooper by a mile. Alice Cooper's a great yeah. guy. And I've listened to him, lots of interviews with him, and he's a really fascinating guy um, about his art and how he overcame alcoholism and how he held his marriage together. And mm. he's a really great dude. So... He's the most, yeah, he's the loveliest guy there. I got some bad news for you, man. I read an interview with Janet Jackson the other day and they asked her if you could have dinner with any host of the Unmade podcast, who would it be? And she chose me. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I like the lyrics guy. Oh, well, that's a shame. That is she, a shame. she did say she wanted to sample your guitar riff, though. Did she? Did she and use it? Can I, can I ask, if you were to meet with one of the new kids on the block, which one would you meet? Firstly, can you name them all? Yeah, I reckon, I, that's a good one. All right, I'm going to try and name them all. Jordan and John, they were the brothers. The, uh, they're the Knights. It was Knight. Yep. Jordan and John Knight. Danny Wood, Donnie Warburg, yep. Joe McIntyre. Yeah, well done. I did it. I named them. Very well That done. is pathetic. <laughs> Only a true fan would name them. My uh, my sister used to get like the actual New Kids on the Block like fan magazine and had posters of them and would listen, like, you know, I was pretty au fait with uh, New Kids on the Block. After we talked the other night, I have to admit, I looked them up on YouTube um, hmm. and they're, they're bouncing around dancing, like they're touring again. And, um, hmm. but they're like older than us, right? So hmm. it's... Uh, it, it's oh, like oh thanks man you say that like it's oh it's, it's a wonder they can walk <laughs> <laughs> they're older than us well <laughs> look at us <laughs> well we're no longer touring so <laughs> no <laughs> <laughs> i think we're maybe we're due for a comeback tour though <laughs> do, do you reckon a reunion <gasps> wow yeah Wow. Which new kid? What's the singular of new kids on the block? Which new kid on the block would you want to meet? Which one would I want to meet? I know who you're going to say. Oh, uh, well, I don't even know who I want to say. Okay, I don't I don't want to meet Danny. Um it'd you, be Donny for you, surely. You reckon Donny Wahlberg? Yeah. Yeah. I, I at guess. least his brothers with Mark Wahlberg. <laughs> Marky Mark. Marky Mark had a great song, that Good Vibration song. That was a good song. John, John, I think, went into real estate, which suits him more than being in a boy band, that's for sure. Maybe that's why he wasn't there for that first award when they say, oh, we don't know where John is. Maybe he was closing a deal. Or he, was, <laughs> <laughs> he was doing a viewing. <laughs> John uh, took a little more time getting ready for the, uh, I guess, performance. So uh, 
He'll be here. He's still in the group. No rumors. <laughs> At the back on his mobile. It's got two bedrooms, <laughs> one bathroom. <laughs> Oh dear. They were the first of a whole stream of boy bands, weren't they? Yeah. Yeah. So did you go on to watch more American Music Awards? Like did it become an annual thing for you or like what's your what's your award ceremony viewing regime like these days even? I never saw another American Music Awards that I can remember. I mm. have watched the Grammys from time to time, but not for 10 years at least. I think because they don't even show them in Australia. It's a bit like if it's on and it's, you know, late at night, you might like watch a bit of it. But um, mm. I, I did also, the next the next music awards that I taped, I videoed, was the 1992 um, Australian Music Awards. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome live on stage at Dreamworld, Australia's own girlfriend. Take it from me. And that's probably for another episode. <laughs> Thanks, man. In, in case there was any chance people were going to listen to us again, you've completely ruined it now. <laughs> that's, but that's for the next episode. <laughs> it makes perfect sense that having dealt with 1990 American music awards, we'd suddenly jump to 1992 in Australia. Like it's, <laughs> yeah. it's the next in the sequence. Um, That's what I love about the Unmade podcast. It's so unpredictable. You never know what music awards they're going to discuss next. <laughs> <laughs> but Bon Jovi guessed on guested on them, and and John Bon Jovi guest hosted it. So, um, but I won't, I won't give too much away there. But I did tape that one and watch that many times in 1992. I don't watch award shows anymore i guess i put the oscars on and watch the latter part of the oscars but because you often see it during the day it loses its fizz and i just go to sleep i watched the brownlow medal which is the australian footballers <laughs> best and fairest player west coast eagles versus the sydney swans sydney swans w kappa one vote west coast eagles r glendinning two votes Sydney Swans, G. Williams, three votes. This is a this is a vote counting night where they count the votes to decide who the best Australian rules footballer of the year is. And it's famously very tedious because they go through every game and say who got how many votes. Richmond versus Footscray. Richmond, J. Manton, one vote. Footscray, P. Foster, two votes. Footscray, A. McGuinness, three votes. So McGuinness starting to move now. Collingwood versus Fitzroy. That's oh, right, yeah. But that's the only thing I watch that's got awards attached to it, I think. Do you Have you watched an award show? Do you watch the Oscars every year? or No, I stopped watching the Oscars years ago. Mm. Also, since that recent Oscar ceremony where they literally read out the wrong winner of Best Picture mm. and the wrong people got up on stage, mm. it's almost like, what's the point of even watching anymore? They've They've peaked in terms of like the most amazing thing that could ever happen at the Oscars. Mm. Because if 20 <laughs> years ago you said, think of, besides something ridiculous, like, you know, the, the, the auditorium collapsing or something. Right? Yeah. If you said, what is the most ridiculous, amazing thing that could possibly happen at the Oscars that would never happen? You would say, oh, giving the award to the wrong person. And I said, no, think, be more amazing. I'd be like, oh, okay, giving best picture to the wrong film. Mm, you know, mm. the, 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 the climax of the night. Can you imagine? Like, you couldn't, you couldn't make that up. You couldn't make up circumstances in which that happened. You know, because they make such a big deal of how they've got these auditors and accountants that do it, and they even promote them. And there's such a big deal about the security and the locked briefcases and the carefulness yeah, of it all. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Like, if there's just one thing they're not going to do wrong, it's give the envelope to the person to read out what the best picture is. It's the most important, most replayed moment that will happen of the night. It's like, it's just inconceivable you would get that wrong. And they got it wrong. And they got it wrong. Yeah, and now it feels like, oh, what's the point of even watching the Oscars now? Everything's a disappointment. Like, you know, the most amazing thing that will ever happen at the Oscars has happened. And it also did kind of sully it. Not only was it amazing, it did kind of like, it made a joke of, it made, it exposed it for the joke that it is. Yeah, and so I wondered about this. Like, this sort of thing seemed to have been, it used to feel more important, but is that because we were young or because society is changing and it's becoming more egalitarian and 
institutions are becoming less powerful. And also the entertainment industry has fragmented, you know. Mm. Movies aren't the be-all and end-all. These days, movie stars are, you know, starting YouTube channels and trying to get on Netflix shows. It's like, you know, Hollywood movies are not the the pinnacle they once were yeah yeah as 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 the, as the world of uh, entertainment has just yeah fragmented the great unwinding of institutions in globalization hmm. which is the name of Milla Vanilli's second album the great <laughs> <laughs> no brilli to Milly. <laughs> Really, it'll be Brilly to Millie. Brilly to album. Millie is, a, is the worst name in the world since <laughs> Scritty Politi. Do you like Unmade Pop Stars better? Unmade Pop Stars is a good name. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Best left unmade, I think. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Any more notes? Any more? I think I've got, I mean, apart from actually going through it in real time with sort of a director's, you know, voiceover, which is would be tempting. Mm. Um, mm. Tempting for people to watch, yeah. I mean, me doing. I um yeah. I don't think I've got much more to say. I mean I'm I'm totally up for that as a, for a future project w- watching it and commentating it in real time. In That'd real time. Yeah. The the fashion is fantastic. That's one thing. And yeah. I tell you the the new kids on the block have got have have loud at large jackets. There's no two ways about it. They have large loud jackets. I also like the way in their speeches the new kids on the block talk about talk about themselves like they were like, you know, street kids that you know grew up starving in a cardboard <laughs> box just desperate to make music and now it's like they've finally made it like they they really portray themselves as like real real battlers don't they like i'm yeah. sure they're all i'm sure all their parents are millionaires and they were like <laughs> oh there's michael bolton oh i'd forgotten that oh i got a glimpse of michael bolton ladies and gentlemen recording star jody watley and singer songwriter michael bolton we're here to present two new artists Michael Bolton was there, yeah. Well, there you go. Champion. Legend. Still with his long hair, hasn't he? Indeed. The Samson effect hadn't come into effect for him either at that yeah, stage. He was at full power. He, he was. was. Full power. Oh. Yeah. Unbelievable, yeah. He, yeah, no, that's true. That, that The new kids on the block, you know, from our days back in Boston and, you know, when they say, um, yeah. not bad for a couple of kids from, you know, a few kids from Dorchester. Oh, man. Not bad for five boys from Dorchester, huh? And it's it's yeah. like Dorchester sounds really quite nice, actually. Like, what are you talking about? Like, you were not on Dorchester the does sound nice. It sounds like a brand of like a teapot. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Back at Dorchester, where we were we were serving tea, and now here we are at the American Music Awards. <laughs> <laughs> Pass me the Dorchester, please, Charles. <laughs> It's not like, it doesn't sound like there's a lot of gangs in Dorchester like that. It sounds like the f- official pottery supplier to the Queen. <laughs> We've finally got out of that pottery business. <laughs> <laughs> but don't they say some stupid line as well, like, you know, music is the international language, but it's spoken with a Boston accent? Oh, is it, I don't remember that line. Before we go, we just want to say one thing. We want to give respect to the people who also were nominated for this, Bobby Brown and other groups of the 90s like Paula Abdul and Millie Vanilli for helping to show that music truly is the international language and the universal language, even if it is spoken with a Boston accent. I think they get a little bit lost with their own self-importance, but you know, award ceremonies can do that. Yeah, well, the American Music Awards could do that. If you could live your life again and be a member of New Kids on the Block, would you, would you do it? No. Are you sure? No. (laughs) I'm not sure. (laughs) (laughs) Because that would have been a pretty fun few years. Girls would have paid them a lot more attention than they paid us in high school. I do (laughs) do agree we would. We may, may have had more girlfriends or a better girlfriend yeah. or a, a girlfriend. We may have actually had yeah, a girlfriend. I, that, that's the entire criteria I use to judge any life decision. <laughs> would, would it have got me a girlfriend? I wouldn't have liked to have compromised the, the music I did make by selling out. And- <laughs> yeah. Would you rather be Bob Dylan or New Kids on the Block? Well, I don't know. New Kids on the Block had some pretty good looking girlfriends. <laughs> If, if you could be a massive solo artist or a band, surely being in a band would be, if you could get on well and be great mates, then would be surely far better, wouldn't it? You'd, it'd, you'd blow your head no. apart being solo a solo artist. You, solo <laughs> artist. You are just terrible. I can see you. I want be, all the glory. You're going to go solo at some stage. I am. Um, uh, yeah. 
Well, I, I kind of experimented with it in the last episode. You did. You did. You did twenty minutes solo. <laughs> I got pushed right to the back. <laughs> yep. <laughs> It's like you're not allowed to talk. It's like, it's like you're not allowed to play this bit. I'm, I'm going to do the guitar solo. I was literally docking your pay for talking. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Oh, look. See, Richard Mark. See, there's a lot of hair on both sides of his head at the back. That's the thing. It's mm. quite. It's really quite a veranda that's coming back there. It's an, mm. it's 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 very impressive. Epic. You had a fair mullet back in the day. You had a mullet, but you didn't have like a mane like Richard Marks has. No, no. That wasn't yeah. allowed at school. And um, hmm. I liked having a little was bit Was it not of allowed? No. If you turned up with Richard Marks' hair on like the first day of school, <laughs> would they have like sent you home? <laughs> just suddenly one weekend. I just, after one Monday, I come in with that. <laughs> I don't mean actual Richard Marks' hair, like you scalped him or something. I mean just like hair like his. <laughs> Tim, Tim, what's that you're holding? Oh, that's Richard Marks' hair. <laughs> <laughs> Where'd you get that? Oh, he threw it out in the crowd after a concert. <laughs> <laughs> I just imagine taking his hair and going away, and he's and he says, "Wherever you go, whatever you do, I'll be right here waiting for you." <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. All right. No, we weren't allowed to have it past our collar. Not that we had sort of had it past our collar, but you weren't allowed to. Were we not? Right. We are now. Okay. You can you can now if you like. I tell you what, my hair is getting pretty long at the moment. I've got a real mane. Oh, you should grow. You should grow a mullet. That'd be great. I don't know about that. That would, yeah, that would that would be cool, man. No, nah, not doing it. Do you feel Do you feel placated? Have 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 I made amends for the cruelty of the previous episode? You did. There was. Yes. 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 <laughs> I feel. I feel. Whew. Like you know, like I'm. I was all pent up, and now I feel quite relaxed. There we go. Well, oh, I, what? No, no, no. One a... more thing. Clint Black. <laughs> Do you remember Clint Black? Yeah. I always thought. No, no, I remember the name, but in the credits, but. Yeah, yeah. Well, Clint Black sort of makes his debut here, even though he's sort of a young guy. He looks like an older. His debut. Guy. His debut. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I was putting Excellent. on the American neck. I was putting on Clint Black's accent. He was. <laughs> He he somehow manages to look a lot like at this stage, um, Luke Perry. He kind of has a Luke Perry look to him. Um, ah. He even even when he's young, because he wins like best debut single or something like that. But he already looks like an old mm. man. But he's you know his name's Clint Black and he's got a black hat on and a black suit and you know they got the whole image worked out. But I always thought later on, oh, he looks like um, Luke Perry. Oh, I'm I mean, glad I'm glad you we we sneaked that. That fact in at the end, it was <sighs> totally worth you, like, you know, <laughs> saying, wait, 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 I've got <laughs> something really important to you. <laughs> Clint Black wears a black hat. I was, man, if I'd been got home laying in bed and I'd be like, damn it, I forgot <laughs> to <laughs> the Clint Black. I forgot to mention the guy wearing a black hat. <clears throat> we got it in. We got it in, people. All right. Phew. Thank you for this opportunity. I appreciate it. Even if you're going to just wipe this and it never sees the light of day, I got to say it. And for that, I, yeah. I feel very, very um, pleased. All right. Have you, did you remember to press record? This is the last round, round 22. Carlton versus North Melbourne. Carlton, S. Kernahan, one vote. North Melbourne... P. Cracker, two votes. North Melbourne, J. Cracker, three votes. Footscray versus Melbourne. 